So you're painting a picture here of religious freedom being something much more than the person in the street probably realises as they think of an arcane debate in, in Canberra. You know, they're thinking, oh, this is about that unusual bloke down the road who, you know, who wants to go and stand on the street corner and hand out pamphlets. It goes far deeper to the shaping of the Australia that we love. Yes. As part of, in the, in, the, in the Western tradition, you're not even meant to talk about Western tradition anymore, but I don't see how you can get away from it as a useful understanding of the Judeo-Christian influences in the democracies. Today I'm joined by two very special guests. Both are experts on the subject of religious liberty, but from different perspectives, one historical, philosophical, the other from the public policy and legal perspective. I would say right up front, both I know are deeply committed to the idea of human flourishing in the context of freedom to do so. We start from a place of goodwill in a difficult area that's attracting a lot of controversy, but is much more important than perhaps many people realise. So by way of a bit, back, a bit more background, Dr. Sarah Irving Stonebreaker is Senior Lecturer in Modern European History and teaches in the History and Political Thought major at Western Sydney University. She was awarded her PhD in history from Cambridge University. Her first book, I'm very impressed by this, was awarded the Royal Society of Literature and Jerwood Foundation Award for nonfiction. Recently, her research has revolved around the history of religious liberty in the West and also in Australia. That's important. It's a great mistake for any culture to divorce itself from its past. Mark Sneddon is a lawyer and an academic with experience in commercial, not-for-profit and government sectors. He was formerly Associate Professor of Law at the University of Melbourne Law School and a Senior Lecturer at Monash University Law School in Constitutional Law, Banking and Financial Services, E-Business and Communications Law. He was a partner in the law firm Clayton Utes for nearly 12 years he served as Crown Counsel to the Victorian Attorney General and Officer of the Premier for four and a half years. These days, Mark practices in Melbourne and is the Executive Director of a leading think tank, the Institute for Civil Society. Thank you both so much for joining us on this really important matter. My thank pleasure. You, John. Yeah, thank you. So to begin with, I'm going to ask you both to give us your thoughts. What is religious liberty, does it differ thing from things like just freedom of belief and freedom of conscience? Why is it so important in your view? Um, Mark, would you like to kick the ball off on this one from a legal perspective? Uh, and, the, and then we'll come to Sarah on that sort of historical perspective. Yes, certainly, John. Um, look, my answer is, is a bit long, but I, as a lawyer, I, I always find that the, the key issues are in the definitions. So you're asking us to define the term religious liberty, so let's try and unpack that. Well, listen carefully. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I think it has four components, but let me start with a quote from Os Ganes, uh in the Global Public Square, uh, where he said that freedom of religion and belief affirms the dignity, worth and agency of every human person by freeing every human person to align who we understand ourselves to be with what we believe ultimately is. So the first element I would say from that is the freedom of people, religious liberty is the freedom of people to believe what ultimately is and then how to act accordingly based on that belief. Or as our High Court expressed it, uh, religion in law means first belief in some supernatural being, thing or principle and secondly, the acceptance of canons of conduct in order to give effect to that belief. So it's belief about the nature of reality, the ultimate nature of reality, and then canons of conduct that follow from that, our relationship with that supernatural being thing or principle. The second is the freedom to act on those beliefs, both individually and in community with other believers, not just in religious practices like worship and teaching, but in the believer's whole life. And you'll find that in Article 18 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights to which Australia is a party. The third element, I would say, is um, 
a mutual autonomy of the spheres of religion and the state. Uh, the state needs to give religious bodies a reasonably high degree of autonomy to govern their own operations. I think that's very important for the religious liberty of citizens in the state. Uh, and similarly, the religious bodies need to give the state a reasonably high degree of autonomy in its sphere and not try to control the exercise of state power. Uh, we can come back to that a bit later if you like. I'm not in favour of a metaphor of a wall of separation between church and state because I think the wall is permeable or has doors and so I prefer to talk about uh, zones of reasonable autonomy. I think that's more helpful and accurate. And then the fourth element, a very important element, which is a precondition to the other three elements actually being able to be actualised in a society, is that everyone in our society is committed to true tolerance, by which I mean everyone has a responsibility to give everyone else the right and legal freedom to be wrong in our eyes. We have to accord to others the right to express worldviews and beliefs which we suspect or are convinced are wrong and then give them the right to act subject to shared limits, shared agreed limits on those beliefs. So it's a two-way street. It's both a right and a responsibility. So they're my four elements. Yeah, good. Okay. That's, good. That's, I think it's really helpful, Mark, mm. actually. Um, and I think from a historical perspective, probably there's a couple of really important historical points to make. Um, the first is that because religious freedom is recognised in, as you mentioned, Australia's commitment to the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and also, uh, as many people know, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948, Historically, the reason for that is that religious liberty has been very closely entwined with the natural law tradition. Uh, and what that actually means is that there has been a tradition of thinking that dates back uh, a very long time, really to late antiquity into the medieval world, that actually is about the idea that there are certain universal principles, universal rights and a law which is true regardless of any positive laws that might be enacted of any country. And so religious liberty historically has been understood to constitute part of that law in the sense that even from the very beginning, for example, the earliest articulation really of the idea that freedom of conscience is a kind of right that ought to be protected. The idea is that, and this is um, actually one of the Tertullian, who's one of the church fathers in the third century AD, this is the idea that conscience is something that ought to be protected and it actually belongs to all people in all times and all, all places. And so freedom of conscience and its exercise is something that's understood to constitute not just part of the particular laws of any particular country, which as we know historically have waxed and waned and there's a very complex history there, but really religious liberty has been articulated as part of a universal natural law. And it's only because of that, that religious freedom is articulated in things like the UN Declaration and so forth. So that's probably a really important historical point. Uh, and the second really important historical point is to, I think, distinguish between religious liberty and, and toleration. Um, now, there's a history in which the two kind of overlap, but there is, I think, a very important historical and conceptual distinction there too, because there have been instances of religious toleration in differing societies at different moments across history. Religious toleration is really a, basically a kind of pragmatic indulgence of the state or of the dictator, the ruler, where like a certain minority group are given a privilege to kind of practice their religion. But it's not the same as the idea of religious liberty because historically religious liberty, like I mentioned before, because it's understood to be a right, then religious liberty is quite distinct from the idea of toleration. It's a far more powerful idea if it can be articulated and conceived of as a right pertaining to individuals. And it's really that kind of latter idea which is distinctive actually to the Western Judeo-Christian tradition. Yeah, two important ideas there. Actually, probably one other thing historically that we should really add, because this actually answers your question about, well, what, you know, why does religious liberty matter? Why is it important? Um, and that is that historically, understanding religious liberty has been one of the ways in which people have understood the jurisdiction and the limits of what the state can do. So even if you go back to some of the earliest articulations in, say, the Protestant Reformation of Martin Luther defining, well, what are the limits of the state? There is very early on this kind of sense, and it starts with um, 
developed in the Reformation and then in various 18th century thinkers, there's a kind of sense that religious liberty defines a certain fundamental right that is held by individuals and therefore helps us understand what it's possible and legitimate for the state to do. How, to what extent, for example, can the state intrude upon the lives of individuals? And of course, in the West, that's a really important idea. It's a very important idea. And before we explore actually um, sort of the historical outline of, of, of Christians' attitudes towards um, tolerance, um, which is where I want to go in a moment, you mentioned Os Guinness. He has a very valuable illustration that I think is, is worth bringing up here. He talks about the public square. Now, once that was, uh, you know, the forum where the Senate met, then it became the Westminster, the Parliament in England, then newspapers expanded it, and then radio, and then television. And now we have a rudimentary public square that is global because of social media. Yes. At the same time, as we, our differences are greater than ever. So the question is, how will we live peacefully with our deepest differences. Mm. And that's at heart here. It's coming out in the yes. apparent very, very deep divisions. Yes. How do we get over it? Because that limits human flourishing. Hate and you know, Ab discord are terrible things. Ab absolutely. But he paints a very interesting picture. He says, we've got three choices when it comes to the public square. We can have a naked one mm -hmm. where all religion's forced out yes. and all belief is forced out. Mm. You can have one that is religious, where one religion is allowed, even enforced, or you can have an open public square where, subject to certain laws, everyone is free and enjoys the privilege to explore the great issues of life. Yes. I think that's quite useful to think of it. A yes. restricted, yes. totalitarian, state enforced religion, a naked public square, which sounds pretty sterile or one where we can genuinely communicate and we're free to explore the big issues. Absolutely. And that, that, was my, that was my fourth point about tolerance, that if we're going to have a pluralistic democracy which, which accommodates human flourishing of as many different you know, groups and beliefs as possible, and, and yes, there'll be conflicts, so we will need some shared understanding of what is and is not acceptable expressions of those beliefs, uh, understood, but within and subject to those shared agreements on limits on behaviour, um, people should be free to uh, believe their most fundamental uh, commitments and and act on them, and, and everybody else needs to give them the permission to do it. It was in that sense that I was talking about a, a true tolerance from every member of society to every other member of society. I, I wasn't using tolerance in the historical sense of the Tolerance Acts where the uh, the Anglican majority says, oh, let the Catholics in for this purpose or that yeah. purpose or yes. the other way around. Yeah. I was talking about a more, the Os Guinness form of tolerance. So we must have a pluralist public square, yeah. but the precondition of a truly pluralist public square where you don't all just fight each other to the death is that sense of, I'm going to let you do, say and do things which I believe are wrong from my worldview. And the quid pro quo is you let me yeah. do things <laughs> and say things which you believe are wrong from your world point of view. That, that's, that seems to me to be the, the, the only way we can reach the, what I was Guinness is saying about a, a pluralist democracy where everyone is enabled to flourish. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, let's then come to... This idea that some people, um, you know, many public squares, if you like, down through the ages have been marked out by really tough, you will believe this, this is the official religion and you believe it and there's no room for anything else. Christianity is often, with your historical background, I'd be interested in your views, accused of being intolerant uh, and uh, um, dictatorial, certainly offensive. Right. Uh, but I think you would suggest that, in fact, Christians themselves have often argued for liberty and space for dissenters, people who disagree, yes. to have that right. Yes. Yes. So the origins, which we'll come back to in a minute, look, the origins of the idea that conscience lies at the heart of every human being and that it's exercise or worship in accordance with the conscience, to kind of paraphrase Tertullian, in the third century ought to be protected. That's a very distinctive Judeo-Christian idea. But I think just, just to pick up on the first thing you said first before I kind of revisit that history, the first thing that you said about the kind of, in yeah, the history of intolerance, I think there are a couple of important things to note about that. The first is, I think it's really important to kind of recognize that yes, that when 
when there are histories and episodes of intolerance within Christianity, it is a healthy thing and actually a thing in accordance with the very doctrines of Christianity and the teachings of Christianity that the church needs to recognise that and recognise that that is that, that has ha happened. The other interesting thing, though, the other interesting point to make here is that historically the idea of a kind of pluralistic democracy that we were just talking about where people from different belief systems can live together, that idea of liberal democracy has emerged, has a very long history, but it's anachronistic to kind of read back the possibility of religious kind of pluralism into, say, the pre well, into the pre-modern world anywhere because the, simply the idea of the way that states or governments ran themselves in the pre-modern world, the Christian West and elsewhere, relies upon the idea that civil peace and civil harmony is actually maintained through religious unity. It's just not, it's a very modern and anachronistic way to kind of think that there can be religious pluralism in the pre-modern world. It's not how people even thought. It's a much later kind of development. Um, but it is also the case that the idea of liberty for different religious belief systems has its origins in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, I mentioned earlier, so Tertullian in the third century AD gives probably one of the most important and earliest articulations of the idea that, and he's arguing that this right, that every man ought to worship in accordance with his own conscience. Um, this is an argument he makes for all people, regardless of their own uh, religious beliefs. And so he's actually making that as a kind of universal claim. But the reason there, there are kind of a couple of reasons for that. The reason is in part that Christianity for the first three and something centuries of its existence, it has no relationship, unlike any other couple of things that are completely distinct about Christianity as a religion. Um, but Christianity, unlike any other ancient religion, has no relationship with political power at its inception. None. No well, relation. No, it's the, the Christians the are persecuted. <laughs> so it's in the context of Christians being persecuted in the early Roman Empire um, that Tertullian is making this argument. And what that means is that Christians, for a variety of reasons, but this is one of them, Christians or well, people choose to join the faith and become a Christian on the basis of their conscience. It's about persuasion. It's not about relationship with political power because there is none. Um, and so Christians make that decision based upon conscience. And it's a very ancient argument. It's an argument even older than Tertullian, even in the pages of the New Testament. There's actually a distinctly Judeo-Christian idea of the concept of conscience. Now, conscience is talked about in ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, but what is actually distinct about the idea of conscience that is found in the pages of the Bible, Old and New Testament, it's developed more fully really in, in Paul's letters in the New Testament, is that conscience lies at the heart of what it is to be human, that all human beings, regardless of who they are, uh, where they come from, male or female, Greek or uh, slave or free, Jew or Greek, that every person is endowed with a conscience and people will, it depends what people do with that conscience, but it's because conscience is understood to lie at the heart of what it is to be human, to make decisions about and to seek the truth based upon conscience or be convicted as far as a Christian would um, understand and believe, but convicted of sin on the basis of conscience. It's on that basis that people become Christians in the first place. So that's really the origins of the idea that conscience is something and its exercise is something that ought to be protected. It's a very distinctly Judeo-Christian idea at its inception. And as part of that whole business of responding to conscience, it's often pretty hurtful. They can be journeys that are hard to go through. One of the things that worries me is that we're getting a little bit too inclined to say we've got to avoid offending anybody, therefore we've got to clamp down on any speech which might upset people's equilibrium a little bit. Mm. I, I always push back by that against that by saying actually, I think as I look back over my life, some of the most beneficial things that have happened, the things that I treasure most have come about because somebody said something to me mm. that initially was offensive and hurtful. And I'd apply that to my own faith. Mm. When mm. I look back on it, suddenly I realised that I was being told that I was not exactly the person I thought I was. Yes. Are we in danger of trying to protect ourselves, wrap ourselves in cotton wool, to the point where we just turn ourselves into ciphers? Uh, I think there's a significant 
risk of that over control of discourse on the basis of uh, uh, concepts like safety uh, and not giving hurt or offence. Um, clearly, there's always going to be a balance between what is permitted and sorry, what what is good speech and what is bad speech. But the way I think about it is this: we should lean in favour of free speech as a society. Um, we should have minimal legal restrictions on speech. There are other sanctions than legal sanctions on poor exercise of free speech. They tend to be social sanctions. Um, I'm not going to, <laughs> you're not coming to my dinner party or well, I'm not going to meet you at the pub or the cafe because you've taken that view or, or I give you a robust rebuttal of whatever you've just said. Um, or or, <laughs> or we, have a, we have a robust uh, Facebook or Instagram conversation on something. They are the better ways of dealing with poor speech or speech with which we disagree. To impose legal restrictions on speech on the grounds that someone may be hurt or offended is almost always, I think, an overkill. The state doesn't should not be intruding in there. The state should be there to protect you know, things like defamation, people's rights. It should be stopping the incitement of violence uh, against others through vilification laws, perhaps the incitement of of true hatred as well, but but to, to, to go with this modern trend of saying um, we are going to deploy the power of the state, legal sanctions, fines, etc., against people because they say something which other people uh, can be hurt or offended by is, uh, is far too high a price to pay. And as you said, John, the, 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 the classic argument for free speech has always, and, and the risk of offence that that carries with it, uh, has always been that we don't know everything. We don't yet have the perfect truth. Yep. Unless I am exposed to other ideas and other arguments, preferably in a respectful and and and, and rational and reasoned manner, um, I may never change. Yep. I may never get to a better position than I'm in now. Our society may never get to a better position. So the idea that the state can shut things down is, I think, well, throughout history, you <laughs> defer to Sarah, uh, has almost always been a retrograde, um, retrograde step when we've had sedition laws misused and, and all manner of restrictions like that. We need to minimise legal restrictions on, on speech, I think. Uh, there are some cases where it's justified, but minimise them certainly on the basis of people being hurt or offended. And if there's hurtful or offensive things, say, turn it off. Turn, turn the radio off, don't, don't, don't engage on the Facebook, or alternatively engage with the rebuttal, uh, engage with counter-arguments, uh, have those sort of discussions, and that way truth will come out and we'll all get a more rounded view because we all live in our own little bubbles and one of the ways we get out of our bubbles, our social media echo chambers, is to engage with people who have different ideas to us. And, and it strikes me, really, you might both have a view on this. Here's the great irony. For the last 40 years, we've had more and more and more of this legal architecture designed to ensure that we don't offend anybody. Mm. And yet now we live in the age of cancel culture. It mm. hasn't worked. Mm. We know that young people are losing confidence in free speech. We can actually track it. It's probably largely related to social media and uh, iPhones and what have you. From about 2014 in, Amer in America, uh, young people on campus have switched their position from defending free speech as a priority to talking about appropriate speech. Well, who determines what appropriate speech is and why are they looking for it? For fear of being cancelled, which is, a, you know, to deny other people's conscience. So we don't burn you at the stake anymore for having a different view. We cancel you. Yes. And it destroys people's lives, yes. literally sometimes. Yes. So this stuff, it's, it's, it doesn't work. That's what worries me. When the state decides what we can and can't say, often well-intentioned, you can end up in a worse mess than ever. So that raises the next question I'd be really interested in your views on. Do we really need religious liberty protection anyway? Aren't we all free to, you know, to, to go to church and to pray if we want to at home and meet in our own homes? Are we really in danger of restricting religious liberty in ways that are unhealthy? What do you think? Is that a Sarah or a Mark? Oh, that's a Mark question. That's a Mark question. You okay. <laughs> okay, and you can yeah. correct me. Oh, no, okay. I'll see with, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so, well, John, we're not, religious liberty is not at risk in, say, Australia in the same way as it is in some other countries. So if you had a communist government which excludes religion or alternatively controls and licenses the only expression of religion, for example, Chinese 
you know, state-run churches, for instance, uh, nor is it at risk as it is in some other countries with, for example, uh, theocracy, where you've got a majority Muslim population, which is also the government. Um, so, you know, that, that's not all Muslim countries by any means, but there are some with that, with that expression. Um, or alternatively, you've got one very dominant religion which marginalises and puts legal or de facto limits on the adherence of other religions. So that would be, say, the case in India where it's difficult to be a non-Hindu. Mm. Uh, and becoming more difficult by the day. Yes, correct. We so should learn from that. We should learn from that, absolutely. So there are those other countries where you could say they're much, much worse on, um, on religious liberty than Australia. But yes, religious liberty is under threat in another way in Western liberal democracies. And that, I think, is, is largely because of this. Uh, it's because of a competition, I think, between what you might call a, a secular view, a secular worldview versus a religious worldview. It's because of a competition between uh, what Carl Truman would describe as, as a culture of expressive individualism, where my identity is self-determined and particularly might be based on my sexual identity and sexual self-expression. And that is antithetical to the foundation of a religious worldview where my identity is based on my relationship with a creator and what the creator expects of me to live. And they're just very difficult to put together those two views. And so if we have intolerance between those views and it is the um, uh, the secular and expressive individualism uh, worldviews that are making the laws, then they will tend to oppress um, the religious worldview. And that is what we're seeing to an increasing extent. So just, let me just give you a few examples, if I may. So. Um, uh, you, you might think that, that it's still not a problem. Well, uh, we have a case, for instance, we have a several cases where uh, a young woman in Sydney was sitting in a cafe reading her Bible and praying quietly, not, not saying anything, and was asked by the cafe manager to leave because they don't have Christians there. Now, there is no law in New South Wales which prevents someone from being discriminated against on the basis of their religious belief or activity. Uh, similar case in Canberra. Um, there was a cafe case, that is. Um, uh, a young woman called Madeline was sacked during the same-sex marriage plebiscite. She was a contractor to a, um, a party entertainment company. Uh, when she wrote on her Facebook page, and this is all she wrote, it's okay to vote no in the same-sex. she was sacked for that. She was sacked for that. And more than that, her boss called her a homophobe and a bigot. And I could not tolerate having a homophobe and a bigot in my workplace. And you might ask who was uh, demonstrating bigotry in that particular example. Um, but she had no... She had no recourse under uh, anti-discrimination law because she was a contractor rather than an employee. And she was a young woman. She was like early 20s and it was very difficult for her to do that. Um, we had, uh, well, the, the known, well-known case of Archbishop Porteous in the Catholic Archbishop in Tasmania who published the booklet put out by all of the Catholic bishops on, uh, called um, on, on Marriage to Parents of Students in Catholic Schools, so to, only to their own community. Uh, and that book, uh, booklet set out the traditional Catholic teaching on uh, marriage and sexuality, which has been around for 2,000 years. Uh, didn't say anything different, expressed it in moderate terms, but it was objected to by a person who was a transgender activist in Tasmania, uh, who was not a Catholic and did not have children at Catholic schools, but nevertheless found it to be offensive. Um, and under a very broad offensive conduct provision in the Tasmanian Anti-Discrimination Act, made a complaint saying, I was offended and people of... You, uh, LGBTI um, with, with LGBTI attributes would reasonably be offended by this statement of traditional Catholic doctrine and off to the Anti-Discrimination Commissioner. The surprising thing is that the Anti-Discrimination Commissioner took the case and then ran uh, compulsory mediation for nine months, uh, taking up a fair amount of time and resources for the Archbishop. And then after nine months, the, uh, the complainant, the transgender activist, dropped the case and said, I, I can't fight the Catholic Church, they're too strong. I mean, it should never have been in an anti-discrimination tribunal in the first place. It was simply a statement, a moderately expressed statement of a traditional religious view. Likewise, people shouldn't be dragged to a tribunal because there's a moderately expressed statement of transgender views. That's, that's, this is my point about tolerance. We just, we need to have tolerance. So, uh, and there have been people who have lost their jobs because they have expressed um, there was a, a university lecturer in, uh, in WA who uh, part of her contract was not to go proselytising, which is fine, um, but she had some uh, students who would constantly use Jesus Christ as a, as a swear word or expression. And so at one point, having got a bit sick of that, she said, uh, when they were doing that back and forth, I think they knew that she was getting triggered by that, uh, she said to them, do you know Jesus? I know Jesus. That was all she said.
complaint, discipline proceedings. What was the nature of the complaint? Uh, well, offence, unsafe, proselytising. What, because somebody says they know Jesus, that's offensive? Yes. That's somebody else? Well, according to, according to that university, there was a student in, um, Goodness. in another university, so this is a student, not a lecturer, who... Uh, who, who prayed with a friend who wasn't a Christian, but you know that was he said, "Can I pray for you?" She said, "Yes, that was fine." The next day, he was called over by that person and her friends and said, "You're a Christian, aren't you?" "Yeah." Uh, "Yes," he said. Um, uh, "What would you do if you had a friend who was gay? Do you, you don't believe in in, in uh, gay sex, do you?" And his response was, um, "In in my religion, we think uh, sex should be between a man and a woman in marriage, and not not outside." So no, I don't I don't agree with that, but. If this person is my friend, I'm going to love them and be a good friend to them. That was what he said. Uh, complaint was made to student services and he was suspended from his course. So, yes, there are real examples. Because of, he defended. Yes, it was, un, and it was unsafe. He had made them feel unsafe, unsafe. Unsafe. Now, how that sort of statement makes anyone feel unsafe, I don't know. But it's, that's, it's what the point you're making, John, is about the level of sensitivity to what is and is not a permitted view to be put in, well, the public square or a university class or the cafe at university campus, whatever it is. And it's, it's just the absence of tolerance. It's intolerance. And it's intolerance which is then backed by administrators or by the law in the case of the anti-discrimination tribunals. So that they're the types of incursions of um, religious liberty. I also need to say there are plenty of examples of anti-Semitism and um, Islamophobia as well. There was a young woman who was refused uh, admission to a Sydney hotel because she was wearing a hijab. So it's like, why? There's no basis for that. Um, So we do have anti-religious bigotry in Australia uh, and that is the coming from the secular, coming from expressive individualism, coming from a sort of an agenda of advancing progressive sexual libertarianism, all identified as being antithetical to a, a traditional religious worldview, that's the clash. And that's the, that's where the tensions are, I think, about religious, not all of them, but that's where a lot of the tensions are about religious liberty in this country. You're really painting a picture here of what might be called competing human rights. Yeah. So we don't seek a cooperative model. I'll compete with you for my rights. Yes. Which is hardly conducive to a harmonious society. No. It's almost as though... The law is creating a, 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 a fertile place for more activism and more lawfare. Yes. Which I would suggest has been the problem, that, that we've had 40 or 50 years of more and more and more discrimination law, but it's less and less harmony, the very opposite of what I'm sure some well-intentioned people initially hoped it would, would produce. Mm. I, I, it, ha- it has been the case uh, well, let me start another way. I think anti-discrimination law has uh, had played an important role in our society. I think it was very important for dealing with, uh, or is one way of dealing with racial discrimination, one way of dealing with sex discrimination for the advancement of women, uh, age discrimination and disability discrimination. Um, when you start to get into issues of saying you can't, because we've just kept adding in protected attributes, we've, you know, race, gender, age, disability, not likely to generate too many controversies for most people. But then we start adding in things like political belief or religious belief or lawful sexual conduct. And you can immediately see that within society, people are going to have different views about what's appropriate sexual conduct. I mean, the Australian Cricket Board had two different views in respect of a cricketer recently. <laughs> so we, you know, and once those things are out there, the question is, why is the law and an anti-discrimination tribunal or a court going to make judgments about what is and is not appropriate speech or conduct in those sorts on those sorts of attributes? So, so to answer your question. Um, the addition of those attributes and the in, in putting in offensive speech type laws into anti-discrimination legislation has taken what is, I think, a basically good idea, anti-discrimination law, but turned it into the venue, the venue for, for the culture wars. Mm-hmm. So it becomes the legal expression of some of the culture wars now. Sarah, I'd be fascinated by a sort of a, a historical perspective of, of all of this. And it seems to me to be really important because in many ways, We've come from societies which were highly polarised and very tribalised. Yeah. You know, you clubbed around with other people to defend yourself in a dangerous world. 
We then move to a cooperative model, you know, love your neighbour. G.K. Chesterton famously said, the Bible demands that we love our neighbours. It also demands we love our enemies. All too often they turn out to be the same people, but it doesn't free us of the obligation. I sometimes wonder whether tolerance is a virtue of the same ilk and standing as love. Yes. You know? Yes, and there's been a whole history of hundreds of years of important Christian but also political thought within the Christian tradition influenced by Christian ideas. If you take John Locke's letter concerning, or letters concerning toleration, for example, on the very issue of, well, what is toleration? How does this actually work in practice? And then actually the whole story about um, the various colonies that were founded in America had different relationships. Some had an established church, some didn't. Rhode Island, for example, had no established church whatsoever um, and was actually specifically created with the ideal in mind that all religions, including, um, to quote the founder, Roger Williams, including people who were pagans, Jews, non-Christian, like and non, non-believers altogether. Um, so he really imagined that it was possible to live in a kind of society where there was, and this is a kind of American uh, paraphrase of this idea, but I think it's a useful term, a kind of marketplace of ideas that people might actually if they share a kind of a commitment to a common set of principles, that you can actually have a diversity of belief and a lively public sphere in which you can discuss belief historically. And I think actually, Mark, just coming back to one of the things that, that you said when you're talking about the prevalence of anti-discrimination law and the, the kind of this sense in which in Australia we're turning more and more to the law um, for, and this is a kind of, an oddity in many ways. Mm. Um, and I think actually a historical perspective might enlighten us a little bit there in the sense that I wonder as a historian whether this kind of sense that we need to turn to the law that is that part of it is that we've actually, we don't have much historical knowledge about the very kind of principles of particularly religious liberty, but also related ideas about, well, what what is a, what constitutes a law and a just law and an unjust law, under what circumstances can we resist an unjust law and so forth. If we lose that kind of, and I think we have in Australia, we're not particularly connected with that historical richness of that tradition of understanding what these principles are that have formed our society and shaped our society. We turn to the law because it's it's immediate, as it were, like having another statutory law passed by parliament is a kind of immediate solution to these problems, precisely because I think the Australian public lack um, a rich kind of historical sense of the very principles, for example, in the, you know, in the common law, the idea that there are rights to conscience protected in the common law. We're not actually having those kind of richer discussions. And I think that might be one of the reasons why there's this kind of sense that maybe another statute will fix our problems. You know, there's an interesting illustration in my way of thinking out of the Royal Commission of Inquiry into the banking and the financial services. And people say, isn't it great that we had that and we discovered how terrible it all is and now we've got 78 new recommendations all involving more policing, more law, more penalties and had to deal with the situation. No, uh, in my view is it would have been far better if people had done what they ought to have done and didn't need to be coerced. Hmm. We think the answer is more and more laws and we now know we're paying an economic price for it because it's been jamming up the financial system. This, this approach, when people won't do what they ought to do, guided by a broadly accepted sort of set of moral norms, yes. I, I think you're suggesting to us that as a historian, to cut ourselves off from our past and its understanding, if you like, of a common set of basic um, moral precepts and understandings including, I think, a deep commitment to the idea that we have to respect our neighbours, even if we disagree with them, that's largely washed out. That that loss of history is a big part of our problem? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I, one of the things that strikes me so much as a historian um, of ideas broadly is that there is such a contemporary furor in public debate about religious liberty, and yet there is so little knowledge of by the very people who are participating in public debate often, of our own history in Australia of yeah. the idea of freedom of religion and what that has meant and what it hasn't meant. Yeah. Um, and I think you see it in particular, like one example I think is really egregious is that 
there is a particular misunderstanding of what it means to live in a secular state. So one of the things, one of the ideas that you'll find in the public discussion of religious freedom all the time is that because Australia is a secular state, uh, therefore there'll be no discussion of religion in the public sphere. And yet historically, that's not what no, Section 116 not, of the Constitution... And it's not, even a, it's not a history either. It's not a history. We're, we're not a secular country. We have a secular system of government which knows no religious truth but treats religions equally and neutrally. But the government doesn't ignore the fact that there are religious people in the country and religious organisations and institutions. It just has to handle them even-handedly. Yes. Yeah, and, 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 and the idea that we're a secular society and therefore religion must be out of the public square is a, is a, is a fiction uh, and a myth created by secularists who would like that to be the case, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. You, see, you see that tradition historically in France, very much part of the aftermath of the terror of the French Revolution. Um, but that's not the case in Australia. It's not what religious liberty has meant in Australian history. And moreover, actually, one of the fascinating things about exploring the history of ideas about religious liberty in Australia is that actually ideas of religious freedom have been used by and helped to protect groups that we have actually completely overlooked and would actually startle people if they knew. I think one of the most um, amazing examples of this is that in 1927, you have really possibly the earliest articulation of the idea that Indigenous Australians have basically a kind of religious freedom, a right to the sacred sacred objects and sacred places of worship that are there. So what happens in 1927 is that there are some stones, Chirunga stones, uh, sacred stones that belong to the Arunta people in Central Australia. And through dubious means, probably they were stolen. They end up in Melbourne because it's the late 1920s. There's, there's a discussion in public debate like, OK, so what happens to these stones? Uh, should they go to a museum? Uh, there are arguments that they can be bought and sold on the private market. But then interestingly enough, the Aborigines Friends Association, uh, so Indigenous people, but also, f fascinatingly enough, uh, supported by non-Indigenous supporters, chief among whom is the Evangelical Anglican Archbishop of Melbourne, Harrington Lees, and a, an Evangelical uh, Baptist minister. And they actually make the argument that the Arunta stones ought to be returned to the Arunta people. And the argument's essentially a religious liberty argument. It is saying what they argue in, in the press is that they ought to be returned because they are objects that are sacred to the Arunta people and that they ought to be afforded, therefore, the same rights of those sacred objects in the same way that a cathedral, and that's actually literally the image that they use, in the same way that a cathedral is sacred to Christians. And this is such a fascinating example, I think, of the way that actually religious liberty in Australia has an incredibly rich history. And it's been used by people, including, for example, of Indigenous Australians, to make arguments for a variety of religious rights of people, not just Christians, obviously, but Indigenous people too, um, and non-Christians, actually, um, and even atheists. So you're painting a picture here of religious freedom being something much more than the person in the street probably realises as they think of an arcane debate in, in Canberra. You know, they're thinking, oh, this is about that unusual bloke down the road who, you know, who wants to go and stand on the street corner and hand out pamphlets. Let him do it. He's harmless. Or, you know, um, so-and-so up the street who's, whose daughter's uh, gone off to be a missionary. I think that's a bit odd. Why are they wasting their lives doing that? But we, you shouldn't stop them. It goes far deeper to the shaping of the Australia that we love. Yes. As part of in the, in the, in the Western tradition. You're not even meant to talk about a Western tradition anymore, but I don't see how you can get away from it as a useful understanding of the Judeo-Christian influences in the democracies. There are roughly 180 countries in the world today. Around 42 or three of them could be called democracies. All bar three or four of them started out profoundly influenced by the Christian faith. And the three or four have been influenced more recently. Think Hong Kong, think Thailand, Taiwan, think North Korea, Singapore. Um, and yet that's airbrushed out as though Christianity's always been the problem, not the foundational sort of um, ethos, you know, love your neighbor, yeah. even when you disagree with them, everyone has dignity, everyone has worth. All of that's airbrushed out. And this is part of this loss of historical understanding, it seems to me. It seems to me to be very problematic. Yeah. Yeah, it's because very much... Because we could lose our freedoms. Yes. I don't see how any society can be free once you unreasonably clamp down on freedom of conscience and belief. You, it can't. It can't be. It can't be. And in, in a sense, I was going to go back to Os Guinness. He would argue 
that freedom of conscience and belief, I don't think I'm putting words in his mouth, freedom of speech, freedom to assembly and to associate mm -hmm. or not associate, mm -hmm. and indeed freedom to property rights. Mm -hmm. You know, your home is your castle. You can go there mm -hmm. and do as you please. And if you have a good, uh, you know, if you're a farmer and you produce an extra carton of eggs, they're yours to sell. Some feudal overlord can't take them from yes. you. Yeah, or give away. They all belong together and you weaken one and we weaken others and yet there's no proper understanding of that. Yes. The un understanding is very weak. So, um, so, so two, two points. One is uh, I, I love Sarah's example because what that shows is that a commitment to um, – uh, religious liberty, certainly coming from the Judeo-Christian heritage, is a commitment to religious liberty for all. Yes. It's not just me and my group. Yeah. It means I have to give it to others. I have to give it to the Aboriginal people or to other people who I don't believe. And and I would even say you have to give a liberty of conscience to people who have no religious belief yes. as well. So that I think that's a really important point. And that 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 then cuts it. It comes into love your neighbour, doesn't it? It comes from love your neighbour, I think. Yes. And it cuts against uh, the the sort of the the grasping, thrusting uh, uh, model of too much modern life, which is I and my group are going to fight to get the power to make the laws or yeah. whatever it is that we want. So it's this model, isn't it, saying, no, what I, what, what I would like for me and my group, I must, I must give to others as well, even if I disagree with them. Yes. The, the same yeah. freedom that Absolutely. I have, they should have too. Yes. Yeah. And actually, Mark, I think one of the great um, illustrations of this in Australian history um, is an illustration where it, it's actually the case that a religious liberty argument has been used to protect people of no particular belief. Um, and that is with the idea of conscientious objection to military service. So in 1903, Australia's Defence Act protected those who conscientiously object to go to war on the basis of religious grounds. So religion varying forms, but any kind of religion was mentioned. Then there are two subsequent um, revisions to those to that Commonwealth Act over the next two decades. And those revisions removed the word religion and basically just protected it as a conscientious, a right of conscience, like a freedom of conscience, and therefore a kind of free exercise. But I think what that actually is a great illustration of, John, what you were saying earlier, which is that these ideas about freely kind of loving and protecting the rights of others, regardless of whether they're fellow believers or of no belief whatsoever, because with the Commonwealth Defence Act example, you could be, a, you'd be an atheist who happens to be a pacifist. They are so entwined with Australia's uh, history and values that actually they are, they, they protect all people. And this is something we've kind of forgotten when in contemporary debate, we tend to just think that it's really only about a bunch of Christians. Yeah, you see, you talk there about loving and protecting mm. those around you, other, your fellow citizens, but that's not the talk now. The talk is all about empowerment. It's all about power. People want political power for the sake of the political power to lord it over somebody else, not to build a fairer, more merciful, more just society. Where everyone can flourish. Yeah. Where everyone can flourish. Mm. And you know, we need to take a big reality check. Can either of you have a perspective on how, how did this happen? How did we lose this heritage? See, historians will tell you, you're a historian, that societies rise and fall. Uh, you know, it's, there's nothing unusual about that. You know, they achieve greatness usually on the basis of shared common belief and what have you, rising prosperity, more learning. Yeah. And then they start to become self-indulgent, self-centred, lose an understanding of the common good and a commitment to the common good. Is that what's been happening in, in Western societies and in Australia? I think, look, there is an extent to which that's true. And there's a, a number of, I think, very profound historical explanations of this, what's really broadly a kind of like history of ideas in the sense of like history of how Western societies like Australia have understood themselves over the past couple of centuries. I think it's really important to point out though that one of the kind of, and this again, it's oversimplifying very complex kind of process that historians like Carl Truman, also a philosopher like Alistair McIntyre has written about this, um, and also philosophers like Charles Taylor who talk about secularization. I think one of the most important processes that they identify in this respect is the way that modern society, well, yeah, coming to modernity, modern societies, when you lose a kind of transcendent narrative and a shared transcendent narrative that makes sense of and tells a story about who you are and gives you a sense of principles, 
what you're left with is, in Alastair McIntyre's description, a kind of just, they're just competing value systems. So there's no common ground to which people can appeal to make sense of themselves. I think to some extent, and Taylor's got a different kind of explanation of this, but I think to some extent, this is helpful here because you talked about like, why is there this obsession of explaining everything in terms of power? Mm. Um, and I find even as, as a scholar intellectually, uh, there is definitely a, yes, I've seen in, in scholarship, historical scholarship, that everything, there's a trend in which everything is really understood to be about power. It's unmasking power. And I think to some extent, the recourse to understanding things purely in terms of power, uh, and I think like the Friedrich Nietzsche the philosopher is kind of right about this, is that when you lose that kind of overarching transcendent narrative, all you're left with is kind of describing plays of power. It's all about power because you've lost and you, as a society, you're tacitly admitting there is no transcendent narrative. So all you have is a kind of will to power. Um, that's a very great simplification of, I think, a very complex sort of processes and a constellation of historical processes over the last few hundred years. But I think that kind of secularization and that loss of an overarching shared narrative to which we can appeal to, to talk about principles, to talk about a shared set of values is definitely a part of this. It's almost back to the future, isn't it? The sort of uh, the pre-Christian idea, because the whole point about Christianity is you've got this, this, this story of of Christ as God humbling himself to a cross, not exercising power, surrendering it completely and submitting to the abuse of misapplied, unfairly applied law, uh, abuse really. Um, it, it's counterintuitive for us because of our essential pride and our desire to lord it over others. All, all humans um, are, are selfish, uh, and um, that means all societies have a tendency towards selfish advancement of individuals and and groups. And what you need is a very strong counter narrative, uh, which is built around the common good, the need for everyone to flourish, um, those conditions to be there, not just for me and for my group, which becomes the elite, but for all groups. And that, that, that's always been hard for humans in the societies, I think, to do that. But the societies that have flourished have been the ones that have managed to do that and give not, not just power to the, to the elite, but uh, give, give space for a whole variety of people to live their, not live their best lives. That's what my teenage children say. But, you know, live, live, live a life in accordance with their own conceptions of what makes them, of, of human flourishing. Um, it's it's difficult, but unless we try it, unless we keep persevering with it, we just end up in a war of all against all, where we struggle for power, don't we? And 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 you know, so the, the Marxists and the critical theorists and so on have, have gone there, and that's infecting uh, the perceptions of many disciplines, and including history. And from what I hear you you saying, uh, but it's it's ultimately. Uh, it's ultimately a destructive route, isn't it? Because there is no way out of that other than to say, well, I mean, I'll be interested in your opinion. There seems to be no way out of that other than to say, uh, my group has the best ideas, we should run the show, uh, you're bad, go away. It, it, I mean, it, it, if, if it's a competition for power and that's all it is, because I think I'm right, but there's no way for me to negotiate what is the right or the good with you other than to say, I've got it and you don't. Uh, then we're just into a power struggle, aren't we? And that's that becomes destructive of societies. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, it takes you back to the law of the jungle. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I think importantly, historically, it's important to point out that, look, unmasking power and talking about power relationships is, of course, and, and I know that you're not saying that that's not an important thing to point out. And yes. that we, yeah. But it's not the that, totality of, it, of the, the, the narrative of human history, is it, or society. On. Yes, correct. Yeah. Mark, I'd very much like to now just come to some of the legislative uh, measures that we're seeing happening right at the moment, and a couple of them in your home state of Victoria. Um, is it true that, um, I think this is quite amazing, that anti-discrimination legislation provides exemptions in Victoria for politicians and political parties uh, so that they can discriminate against people who don't share their beliefs and worldview, yet there's now legislation afoot to oblige schools and religious bodies to take people who do not share their views and may even 
want to be activists to undermine things that they don't like in those bodies. Uh, just before I answer that, I should say, that, like I gave a few examples to your listeners and viewers before of uh, religious liberty issues. If they want to follow uh, real examples in Australia, if they want to follow those up, they could look at australiawatch.com.au for examples. And they could also have a look at the Executive Council of Australian Jury um, page on uh, anti-Semitism and there's an Islamophobia register. So that all those resources are available on the internet if they want to see what is actually happening in terms of religious liberty examples. So uh, under, to, to, a short answer to your question is under the Victorian anti-discrimination legislation, uh, in, you can't discriminate in employment on the basis of a number of attributes, including political belief and activity or religious belief and activity. Um, but the nature of anti-discrimination laws or the, the architecture that, that the Western world has used is um, may not have been the wisest architecture, but what it does is it starts off with a very broad prohibition saying, thou shalt not discriminate on the grounds of sex or uh, age or religious belief or political activity. But if you stop and think about that for five minutes, you work out that that's not actually the way the world works because um, we do need, in some cases, to discriminate on the basis of sex. So we don't have the women's, um, the, you know, the 16-year-old girls' football team play the 16-year-old boys' football team because that would be problematic in terms of competition and injury. So you're allowed to... Uh, I'm sure there's somebody who wants to change that. Well, there? well, there may be, but that, what I'm saying is there is an exemption in the Act. And these things are cast as exemptions. So you've got the broad principle at the start, but it's too broad. It's too broad to actually fit the way society works. Uh, and likewise on age. So, you know, my son's under, uh, you know, pl plays, well, he used to play in the under 12 uh, soccer team. And I'm very grateful that he wasn't set up against the under 18 boys because he would have been mowed down. All right. So but that's age discrimination. Um, and there's, you can't discriminate on the basis of physical ability, but uh, you can if you're playing sports and elite sports, if stem strength, stamina or ability is required. So all of these things are exemptions to what's an overbroad principle in there because the overbroad principle doesn't actually fit the way uh, society runs. You can't discriminate against someone on the basis of pregnancy, but it's all right to have a rule to stop pregnant women going on certain uh, roller coaster rides at theme parks because it might be harmful to the, the, the child they're carrying. You, you get the idea. Well, actually, just to pad that out, yeah. what you're actually saying is that some forms of discrimination are good. But the mantra out in the public arena now yes. is that any form of discrimination is evil. It, yes. Uh, well, so it's, it's the a broad, broad principles yep. are often more than inadequate. They can be downright dumb. Yeah. Well, well they're, they're too broad to work. And, and, and if you take them as an absolute, they're dumb. That's, that's correct. Uh, nevertheless, I mean, you know, we have an intuition as a society that people who are not relevantly different should not be relevantly treated differently. And that's, that's right. But the, de the devil is in the detail is what is a relevant difference. So I would say some discrimination is good and reasonable and some discrimination is unjust and unreasonable. I mean, it, it, was, the, um, it was the awards night at my son's school last night and look, it's just loaded with discrimination. In fact, everything a teacher or a university academic does is loaded with discrimination. Only some people get in. Well, there's discrimination. Only some people get a high distinction. Some people get a credit. Some people get special consideration. Some people don't. Every act there involves discrimination. So discrimination is good and part of society. The question is discrimination on certain attributes. We're a bit more cautious about. We're going to want to look at those a bit more closely. But even if we say, as I've said to you before, let's not have discrimination on the basis of age or a political belief or whatever, we immediately come to the point of saying, well, hang on, that's not going to work in some contexts, the under 18s versus the under 12s, or in the context that you raised, the issue of political employment. So a political party wants to employ someone, an MP wants to employ someone, a minister wants a ministerial advisor, there are plenty of those in government. Can the minister employ or can the government employ ministerial advisors of the same political persuasion? Can they prefer to do that? What if the person changes their political views during their employment? Can they be gotten rid of? Well, yes, because there's an exception to the general principle that you can't discriminate on the basis of political belief or activity. And it's a very sensible exception because if the, the Greens and the ALP and the Liberal Party are not very diverse organisations, the Liberal Party is full of Liberals, the ALP is full of Labor supporters, the Greens are full of Green supporters. Um, if they had to take, if the Greens had to take coal lovers 
as their communications director and then part of their policy, it wouldn't work. You'd have internal fights within the organisation. So in order to maintain the coherent ethos of a political organisation or political employment, they have to be able to discriminate, if you like, or put it another way, prefer to employ, hire and retain people who are on the same page with political views. So then we come to religion, same, same idea, R political belief and activity, religious belief and activity. Does a church or a mosque or a synagogue or a religious school, should it be able to prefer in the hiring and retaining of staff people who are on board with the beliefs and practice of the religion? Well, of course. It's exactly the same. I mean, the idea that a mosque should be made by anti-discrimination law to employ people who are not Muslims is nonsense. How is a church going to function if it has to employ people who are atheists or believe in another religion and deny the divinity of Jesus Christ? It's not going to work. So you need those sort of exceptions. Which, so, I mean, I would think a Muslim school would have every right to say no if one of its staff said, I'd like John Anderson to come and talk at our speech state. They should have every right to do that. Yes, indeed. Uh, but, but equally, they might, in their freedom, say, yes, we'd love to have John come yeah. and talk. They so it's, it's a free... absolutely free... It's a freedom. ...to discriminate against yeah. that invitation? Yes. Against me by not extending it? Correct. Or to say, we'll have him. We'll have him, yeah, exactly. Or we might ask him not to go there <laughs> in, his, in his comments or whatever. Yeah. So, so yes, so it's, it's almost like... Those sorts of groups, values-based groups, uh, which are designed to um, live out and speak for and advocate for a particular way of life and worldview, and, and to that I would put obviously religious groups, but also political parties and maybe some environmentalist groups like you know, Greenpeace and so on, uh, they should have the freedom to prefer to employ people who are ambassadors for the cause and not to retain people who are no longer going to be ambassadors for the cause. So that's the issue that you find with the, what, and all of this is done by way of exemption. Uh, I think the language is bad, but that's because we have the very broad rule and then we have the carve outs to come back from it. So let's call them balancing provisions. The balancing provisions for religion around the country are generally that a religious body or a religious school is allowed uh, to uh, do things which are necessary to be done in order to give effect to, the, or which are in accordance with, I'm sorry, the religious beliefs, tenets or doctrines of the religion, or which, which protect the religious sensitivities of the people of the religion. So if you find that um, someone is no longer in a church, someone is no longer willing to teach the divinity of Christ or the actuality of the resurrection, or in a mosque, they're no longer willing to teach that the prophet uh, spoke the truth, or the Quran is the word of God, um, you can say goodbye. And that's just eminently sensible, but that relies on this exemption. What the Victorian government, to come back to your question, what the Victorian government is doing now is winding that back in a number of ways and only in relation to religious exemption. So they're leaving untouched the ability of political parties, MPs and ministers to still, uh, still discriminate in relation to the employment of staff on the basis of whether the political beliefs and activities of the staff align with that of the minister or political party. They're leaving that untouched. But for religion, they say, oh, no, no, we can't do that. Um, that they're making about two or three different changes. One is to say um, you can only do that sort of discrimination or preferencing in relation to positions in your religious organisation if it is an inherent requirement of the position that the person has the same, you know, th their beliefs, their religious beliefs and practices conform to those of the religious body or the religious school. Now, okay, you think fair enough, but who gets to determine that? Well, it's not the religious body. It's not the religious school, it's the anti-discrimination commissioner or a tribunal or a court. And the published policy of the government that goes with this is to say, well, we don't think the maths teacher or the uh, secretary or the, the bursar or the finance coordinator or the IT person at the mosque or the church or the school or whatever needs to do that. But, but you know, they can, they can do that just as well whether they're an atheist or, or, or of a different religion. Maybe the principal at the school, maybe the minister, um, uh, but maybe the religious studies teacher, but really no one else needs to be needs to have that inherent requirement. So, so no, you can't prefer in respect of positions which the anti discrimination commissioner, the uh, tribunal, or the court says are not inherent requirement positions. And that's now being determined by a secular body, by an arm of the state, or will be under this legislation, which is expected to pass today.
rather than by the religious body, which comes back to that principle I, I made uh, set out very early on, that there needs to be a reasonable level of autonomy between the state and religion. And here we have the state intruding itself into the affairs of religion, saying, oh, we'll determine who you can hire and who you can sack on the basis of their conformity, whether conformity to your religious beliefs and practices is important. We'll decide that. The secular state will decide that. Now, how the secular state's going to decide that is a very good question. The second, the second principle which this bill will introduce is to say that whatever action, e even if you have an inherent requirement of position, that is the person's beliefs and uh, religious practice have to conform to that of the body, if the religious body takes some action against them because there is a non-conformity of, of belief or action, uh, religious belief or action by the person, there is a super added requirement under this new law that says, Whatever that action is, it has to be reasonable and proportionate in all the circumstances. So I've now found that the, you know, the youth pastor or the, the, the home studies teacher or, or whatever no longer believes, uh, and 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 we've asked them to step down from that role or do something else or, or leave the organisation. Uh, they'll now be able to say, even if it was an inherent requirement of position, they'll now be able to bring an action and say, well, that's not reasonable and proportionate. And guess who gets to decide what's reasonable and proportionate? The Anti-Discrimination Commissioner, the Tribunal or the Court, an arm of the state, gets to say to a religious body, hey, you've gone overboard. You know, and proportionate to what? So I'm a tribunal member or a judge. I'm sitting there saying, I've got to work out whether dismissing the, uh, the home studies teacher or the, the youth pastor or standing them down uh, because they no longer believe the doctrines of the church or the mosque or the synagogue, I've got to work out whether that's proportionate. Proportionate to what? Proportionate to what I and my social circle believe as a judge? Proportionate to the beliefs of the people of the religion? How do I work that out? Am I getting evidence in from people to say, what is the theological severity of this? Uh, is this a really important doctrine or not such an important doctrine? Who, whose evidence do I take here? It's just, it's madness. It's a mad intrusion of the state into the internal affairs of religion, which, as you've pointed out, John, is not being <laughs> not being applied to ministerial advisors. Ministerial advisor who's sacked because they've gone marching in a pro coal march, they're, they're sacked by the Greens, is not able to say, "Hang on, that's not reasonable and proportionate." I'm taking you to court. That, we're not we're not applying that rule to our to the politicians. We are going to apply it to religion. And the third thing which this bill does um, is to say that the only basis, if, if it's an inherent requirement of position, the only basis on which the religious body or the religious school can uh, preference or discriminate is in relation to the religious belief or religious activity of the person, not any other conduct. So just think about that. Every religion has beliefs. Every religion has religious observance practices. And every religion has moral codes of conduct things that you should and shouldn't do in your general life. Okay? Now, um, let me take three examples. Um, the pastor at the church, uh, it turns out, has been having a series of adulterous affairs. Um, you would hope that in, say, a Christian church or any, any religious body, there would be grace shown for, you know, so, so, uh, the, the occasional, the one-off um, transgression. But let's say we've got someone who's really into it uh, and, and is having a series of adulterous affairs. Uh, and the church or the mosque wants to say, I'm sorry, that's not consistent with standing you down or asking you to leave. Well, in Victoria, after this bill is passed, the pastor or, or whoever, the employee, whoever will be able to say, um, but I still believe the doctrines of the religion and you're just pinging me on this, my sexual conduct out here, whereas that's a protected attribute. Any lawful sexual conduct is a protected attribute and adultery is perfectly lawful. Nothing illegal about adultery. So you can't, you can't discriminate against me on the basis of my adultery. Or, or alternate, we're about to make sex work. Uh, we're going to decriminalise sex work in Victoria. Uh, so I have a side job as a sex worker. Well, you can't discriminate against me because of my lawful occupation. Or um, uh, in, my, in my spare time, I go out and aggressively collect debts from uh, little old ladies who can't afford it and threaten them. Uh, it, but legally, I just I escape very close to the law. Um, you might think that's not a very Christian or Muslim thing to do, well, but you can't discriminate against me because that's my lawful occupation. Uh, so <laughs> the government in its conception of religion is saying religion is beliefs, 
plus religious observances, and that's it. You can't look at any conduct or anything in anyone's life regardless of that. So this sort of hamstrings religious bodies in terms of the way that they deal with stuff. And it comes back to this conception I think we were talking about earlier about religion is, is, is a whole of life thing for most people, isn't it? It's not, it's not just I believe this and I pray and I you know, go to mosque or, or synagogue or church. It's a whole of life thing. It's the way I live my whole life. And so I can be, you know, I, I can be held to account um, in the way I live my whole life as to whether that measures up to the doctrines and tenets of the religion, but not in Victoria, not, not after this in Victoria. So that's what this law is going to be doing. And that really is going to hamstring um, religious bodies and religious schools. And then it's going to apply, I've talked about employment, but it's going to apply exactly the same rules to the role of religious schools in relation to students. So if student conduct is in any of those examples I've just given you, sorry, you can't do anything about that unless it has to do with the student's religious belief or religious observances. That's going to be pretty difficult to run a religious school uh, in some contexts, isn't it, if you can't look at student conduct on some of those other measures. It really does make a mockery of those who insist that church and state should be separated because they only ever want to part, apply it selectively. No, 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 you dare not comment on the matters of the, of the state or the government. Mm because of the separation, hmm. because it's misunderstood doctrine. It goes back to separate. Yeah, historically, but it's very it, interesting. Oh, no, it's perfectly all right for you to interfere in the operation of the churches. That is absolutely lethal mm -hmm. for true freedom mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and a truly pluralistic society. It's lethal. And yet there doesn't seem to be any serious opposition in Victoria. Well, well, the, uh, uh, the, the opposition parties, the coalition, have opposed this law and they've, they've, they've rallied against it, and a number of crossbenchers will vote against it, but the government has um, uh, three, at least three cooperative um, uh, upper house members who, who, who swing left on these issues, and they'll vote it through and they'll go through. I, I would imagine we'll find out today, but I, I would imagine that's going to happen. And, and this, churches have kicked up a great fuss, and uh, Islamic schools, I've spoken to the Isla Islamic schools, they've kicked up a great fuss as well, but you know, it just all falls on deaf ears. Yeah, I think interestingly, just a interesting historical point, like what you were saying before, this strikes me as fascinating, kind of almost bizarre historically, because the historical tradition of separating church and state really dates back to Augustine and the City of God. But when it received its various um, really quite formative articulations in the Protestant Reformation, one of the key ideas was really that to distinguish not only the sort of jurisdiction of the church, but also the jurisdiction of the state in order to protect the church or religious body from precisely this kind of activity. Yeah, it's... It's, it's both ways, isn't it? The church, church needs to be... Well, the religion needs to be protected from the state, from undue intrusion, and, and the state should be protected from religion. Religion should not be seeking to get power over and run the state. Yes. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the idea of the spheres of autonomy that I was speaking about before. Yeah. Another piece of legislation which it seems to me that everyone I talk to outside Victoria can see it's not really about gay conversion at all. There's a so-called gay conversion bans. I'd be interested in your comments. I mean, does anybody actually do this anymore anyway? I mean, it wasn't it chasing something that pretty much is not there. But more importantly, it seems to me that far from unintended consequences, this bill actually has far-reaching consequences that are intended in other areas. Mm. Uh, I heard someone comment the other day that in Victoria now, it's quite legal for you to remonstrate with your teenage child if they want a tattoo and you don't think they should have it. Mm. But if they present to you concerns over their gender, unless you are completely affirmative, you may very well find that even as a parent, mm. you're in deep legal trouble. Yes. So, it, look, it, it's it's complicated, but Victoria. The short the short answer is Victoria has gone way overboard compared to the rest of the world in trying to um, criminalise and also subject to a sort of this massive civil enforcement mechanism that they've got through the, running through the Human Rights Commission. Um, any conduct. Uh, which is directed towards a person on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity, which is intended to induce the person to change or suppress their sexual orientation 
And here's the kicker, regardless of whether the person has consented to the conduct or not, regardless of whether the person has consented to the conduct. Now, conduct simply means conduct. It includes a conversation. It includes praying with someone. So uh, what it covers is uh, you, no, I won't use you, John. <laughs> someone comes to me and says, um, uh, I'm struggling with certain feelings about uh, my sexual orientation. Uh, would you pray with me about that? I, I really don't want these feelings. Could you pray that you know, God would take them away? Or, um, this is a hypothetical. I'll make this up. Um, but uh, if I do that and I pray that uh, with them, it's it's a breach of the act. That's a conversion or suppression practice because it's conduct directed towards a person on the basis of their sexual orientation or their feelings, which is uh, intended to change them or induce them to change. Uh, and so that if that caused injury, that would be um, a criminal offence if I was negligent about that. And in any event, the Human Rights Commission, regardless of whether any injury was caused, could come after me um, for engaging in a change or suppression practice. And as I said, it is utterly irrelevant from the point of view of the law that the person asked me to pray with them. Change it around. I'm a counsellor. Someone comes and says, you know, it, it, there may be perfectly legitimate reasons for asking this question. You might be a married person or have been in a stable, unmarried relationship for many years. You might have kids and now you're in your 30s or your 40s and you're starting to get feelings which you haven't had since you were a teenager about attraction to Let's say the same sex. Let's say you're in an opposite sex relationship. But it, you could flip the example. You could be in a same sex relationship and now you're starting to have attractions to someone of the opposite sex. And, and in either case, you really don't want them because you don't want to blow up your existing relationship and the prior commitments that you've made to your partner, be it same sex or, or opposite sex partner. So you go into a psychiatrist or you go to a counselor or you go to a pastor or an imam and you ask for counsel or prayer. If that counsel or prayer goes anywhere near in encouraging you or inducing you to sort of try to put those feelings aside and focus on your existing partner and family, it's a change or suppression practice. And it's utterly irrelevant that you went and asked for that. It's irrelevant that you consented to it. So this Isn't law, that to deny agency? Isn't yeah, of that course, actually very uh, demeaning to people? It's extraordinarily demeaning to people. And uh, I should say the Institute for Civil Society, which is the think tank that I run, we did a survey of all of these laws around the world. There's about 24 of them. I, I can't remember. I've got the, the details are on our website, i4cs.com.au, if, if people want to go and have a look. Um, there's about 24 of these laws around the world. And in every other law, maybe 28, some, um, in every other law, it only applies to people under 18. So an adult, anybody over 18, is free to go and seek counsel, psychiatry, prayer, whatever from anybody. But in Victoria, only Victoria knows that its adults can't be trusted to go and ask for this sort of help. Only Victoria in the whole world. So it just it boggles my mind that a so-called progressive, you know, government in Victoria could say to adults, no, sorry, you can't. Uh, you can't go and seek help. You can't seek prayer. You can't seek counsel. You can't seek psychiatry. If your purpose in doing that is to help, is, is to seek help, not to um, with unwanted feelings about sexual orientation or about gender identity. Now, there may be a case uh, for 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 people under eighteen. Uh, Canada has said it's people under sixteen in some jurisdictions. So, because you've got a potential power imbalance there and that that sort of thing. But but you're right, John. It denies people's agency. And because of the enormous breadth of the prohibition, it's, it's frightening. Victoria is also the only state which has added the word suppression in there. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an illegal practice to induce someone to change. That's, that's common across these other jurisdictions for people over eight, under 18, I'm sorry. But Victoria has added in change or suppress. Now, what does it mean to engage in conduct which encourages someone to suppress their sexual orientation or their gender identity. Um, well, it would be your classic Muslim or Christian or Orthodox Jewish counsel to say, do not act on these feelings outside of marriage. Would, would that mean that's just standard, standard counsel to, um, uh, to be chaste or abstain from sexual conduct same sex or otherwise, outside of marriage. Uh, 
And indeed, you know, they, they would usually say only heterosexual conduct and only heterosexual conduct in marriage. That would be the standard um, counsel of those three, the orthodox branches of those three religion. That sounds to me a bit like suppressing, doesn't it? I'm counseling you to suppress your orientation because they've now changed the definition of sexual orientation to include sexual relations or activity with people of the same sex or the other sex or both sexes. So what was orientation now seems to involve conduct, but that's another complexity in there as well. Uh, and then the, th the third part about this is we've brought in gender identity. So it's not just about sexual orientation, it's about the gender identity of, of a person. Now there are real issues around um, uh, you know, people who have gender dysphoria. Um, but there's also real issues, uh, and they, they, they need to be dealt with sensitively and carefully by people who know what they're doing in terms of um, uh, psychological uh, counselling, medical treatment, and so on. And there's, there's debates around how to do that best. But what does it mean to, to encourage someone to suppress their gender identity? I may be feeling that I'm in the wrong body, but I'm not sure. What's my gender identity at this stage? I don't. No, my 13-year-old girl daughter is saying this to me. Do I have to affirm her? Do I have to take her to a, uh, a clinic which will affirm her and move her on immediately into cross-sex uh, puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones? Because that's one treatment model that's out there. Uh, if I don't do that, am I suppressing her? Am I going to be challenged by the Human Rights Commission? as engaging in an illegal practice taken to the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal and have an enforcement order made against me? Possibly. So this is the hideous overbreadth of this law, uh, that it deals with uh, people over 18, that it deals with people um, uh, about suppression, and that it deals with, uh, it, it intrudes itself into the vex question of gender dysphoria and what is the best treatment model. That's a question for medical practitioners and psychiatrists. It's not a question on which the parliament of any state has any great wisdom. So why is the parliament saying, we know best? Uh, and, and it actually says, if you are affirming someone in a gender transition, go for it. But if you're doing anything else, change your suppression practice. You got the Kira Bell versus Tavistock case in the United Kingdom. Yes. Now, Kira Bell was a, a lady concerned, her, a young lady concerned about her gender. She mm -hmm. started to take suppression medication and then change hormones. Mm -hmm. uh, she's now in her 20s. Uh, she speaks with a deep voice, has to shave, and wishes that she had been counselled. She says, I mightn't have listened, but I wish I'd been counselled as to what it might mean. Mm. Yes, and she's unlikely to ever be able to have children, for example. Yeah, so she's a, a but it wasn't a, explained a regretter and detransitioner, yeah. have, having uh, gone but through in that. Victoria, the very wish that she now expresses as an adult yeah, is denied by the law. Correct, it would be illegal. Yes, that is unbelievably bad law. Yes, in yes. my view, uh, it, it it is effectively, although it says that you can you know give support and and affirmation to people and, and, and help them with explore their identity and so on, it's very clearly leaning in only one way, which is um, assisting people or encouraging them to transition, but not the other way. So yes, the, the, we're going to, I would imagine, I'll say something else very important in a moment, but I think we are going to see as a result of this law, the endorsement of uh, an affirmation process uh, for people. And we do have a bit of a, a, a flood of, uh, rapid onset or, or late onset adolescent uh, gender dysphoria. Um, and, and you know, there's, there's controversy about how that should be managed. There are some clinics which say, well, we'll just believe what you say and we'll put you on puberty blockers and then move you through. And there are other, the more traditional uh, means has been watchful waiting, which is to say, let's just sit with it for a while, try to see if there's any other comorbidities causing depression or stress or anxieties for you, treat those issues uh, and see how this goes. On the basis of six studies that are out there that have never been controverted, that on average 80% of uh, young people with childhood gender dysphoria, uh, uh, it is resolved during puberty with the, with the hormones that come with puberty. Now, obviously that means that on average 20% of people don't resolve and, and they may well go on to transition. So this is not an anti-transition argument. 
Uh, and it's also not an argument that says this is simple. It's, I, I, I think it must be heartbreakingly difficult for people who feel they're in, in the wrong body. And it must be heartbreakingly difficult for their parents and others who care for them to deal with this. But the answer, whatever the answer is, it's, it's to be dealt with, I think, by the person, with the family and with appropriate medical help. It's not a matter for the parliament to tilt the scales and say, we're always, we're, we're, we're in favour of transitioning and there's a legal threat if you don't affirm that. That is just wrong law. Um, and but that's it the law. ignores the adults out there who have been through this and now say, we wish we'd been respected enough. There's no other way of putting yes. it. To have been presented with a balanced set of arguments about the likely outcomes. Correct, correct. It also doesn't take any account of um, uh, that group of people who, uh, who the, the group you've just mentioned, the ones who, who, who wish they hadn't, um, but also in terms of sexual orientation change. For, for most of us, our sexual orientation is reasonably fixed after puberty, uh, homosexual or heterosexual. Um, but for a, a substantial minority, something like 19% of women and 9% of men, it, it can change over, over the life. So you can have Sometimes, you know, uh, they're, not, they're, not all, they're not bisexual in the sense that they can flip from night to night, but over the course of their life, their sexual orientation may change according to the nature of the relationships they have with different people. So this legislation is based on the ideological proposition stated by the Attorney General, nobody can change their sexual orientation. Well, that's just not true. The social science data says a minority of people can. And you can read that Lisa Diamond is a um, is is a is a same sex attracted uh, female professor of sociology, and she's published her studies on this, saying that yes, and then the Australian data on uh, Australian sexual um, health, uh, which this is all you can find this on the I4CS website, brings brings this out as well. There is a minority of people who can change. So, you know, there's a, there's an ideological push here to say nobody can change. But some people can change, and at least for that minority of people, they should have the right to go and seek counsel and medical help and so on about whether they want to change that way or that way. And, and people in, involved in the, the very difficult world of gender dysphoria should be able to access that as well and not have the law tell them what they can and can't do. Moving on to the Federal Religious Discrimination Bill, highly controversial. Um, it, it followed the promise. It was interesting that the then Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, who, who says his greatest achievement in office was the passage of same-sex uh, marriage uh, legislation, mm. said that to him, religious freedom was even more important. Those are his words. Mm -hmm. So it was a commitment from Malcolm Turnbull. People seem to think it's the current Prime Minister's baby, but it wasn't. Mm. It was Malcolm Turnbull's. Mm the Prime Minister who oversaw that other legislation. Correct. And I think that was echoed by Bill Shorten, who was opposition leader at the time, saying, yeah. of course, we need to look after people's religious freedom and the uh, and, and sort of giving space for the views of the, what was it, 37.5% of people who voted no in the, uh, the same-sex marriage plebiscite. So we need to be able to protect them to continue to, you know, to hold that view and express that in their religious or traditional cultural communities. Um, anyway, so I'd uh, just be very interested in your perspective. Uh, it's likely to be an ongoing controversy mm. uh, as to um, how effective it's likely to be. Uh, how, do you, how do you see it? Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, the bill, you mean yes. the federal discrimination. What's likely to pass and what's likely to be its impact? Okay. So, well, the federal religious discrimination bill is a lot bigger than the same-sex marriage debate. That was one. That was one of the genesis of let's do something about religious discrimination, because you know the law currently, as we've described, protects um, the federal discrimination law protects against discrimination on the basis of sex, age, uh, disability, and uh, sexual orientation and gender identity and relationship status, but not religion. There, some states protect against discrimination on the basis of religious belief or activity, but not the federal law. And so this is a this is a gap. It's a very big gap because in New South Wales and South Australia there is no state protection against discrimination on the basis of religion. So you can put up on your um, your cafe uh, door, um, no Christians allowed here, no Muslims allowed here, or no religious bigots allowed here, and it's lawful. It's not it's not illegal discrimination to do that. We wouldn't accept that for any other minority. So just at a basic level like that, you know. Fix it. 
plug, plug that gap, right? Um, in particularly for New South Wales and South Australia, where there are no protections, and they don't in those states there are no protections under the federal. A Fair Work Act either in terms of workplace religious discrimination because the Federal Fair Work Act defers to whatever the law is in the state. So it's possible for your employer in New South Wales and South Australia to discriminate against you on the basis of your religious belief or activity. So I don't, that can't be acceptable in modern day Australia. So let's fix that by a religious discrimination act. Uh, and it's not primarily about, in fact, it's not really about gay rights at all. It's about discriminating, about stopping or make it unlawful to discriminate on the basis of a person's religious belief or religious activity. Um, I think that must be an uncontroversial proposition. So 90% of this bill is about doing that. Um, and I, I have not heard any rational argument as to why that should not happen. Now, there are two or three other aspects of the bill which have attracted some criticism. So when you say it's highly controversial, I think it's Maybe this other five or ten percent of the bill that's controversial, not not the bulk of it. Um, the other five or ten percent uh, deals with these matters. First of all, religious bodies uh, are given a freedom to preference in their hiring, their employment, and their conduct of their religious educational institutions. In the, the same discussion I had with you before about the Victorian legislation, so that right's entrenched in the federal statute. Um, some people. Uh, don't like that because they think religious groups shouldn't be able to preference. But I mean, we've agitated that already. It's exactly the same right that politicians and MPs have to say you can hire ambassadors for the cause who will teach the teach, teach the religion. And that's I think Jacinta Collins came out and said the purpose of having a Catholic school is to be a Catholic school. So you might want a critical mass of Catholics teaching and working in a Catholic school. Maybe you don't need everybody, but you need the right to be able to choose how many people you want to be there to be Catholics and teaching. And not just teaching, but modelling. Modelling what does it mean to be a Catholic? Modelling what does it mean to be a Muslim in a Muslim school? Because you, when you're teaching in a school, you're not just teaching mathematics. You're teaching about the life of being Catholic or Muslim or whatever, or Jewish, whatever the school is. Okay, So in order to model, you need someone who believes and practices. Um, so that's one controversial bit. But I think on analysis, that's not controversial. It, is a, it has been attacked uh, wrongly, I think, in the media, um, uh, mainly by LGBTI groups, as uh, saying this will allow discrimination against people on the basis of their sexuality, their sexual orientation. That is just completely untrue. The only thing this bill would allow a religious group, uh, or religious body, or religious school to do is to preference in employment in accordance with a publicly available policy on the basis of an employee or applicant's religious belief or religious activity. Not their sexuality, not their sex, not their disability, not their age, not their lawful sexual, nothing else, just their religious belief or religious activity. That's all it does. So those charges that this is going to allow uh, discrimination on the grounds of sexuality have no basis in fact. Um, and I'm just amazed that by simply repeating this over and over and over again, even though it's untrue, um, you can scare the horses and people get upset. But anybody looking in a fair-minded way at this legislation would say that's just not going to happen. It can't happen. There is another act, the Sex Discrimination Act, which prohibits uh, discrimination on the grounds of um, sexuality. And there are religion exceptions in that act. And, and that's, where the, that's where the arguments need to be had. Uh, and they're going to be had in a review by the Australian Law Reform Commission during the course of this year about what, what, if any, should be the exceptions to discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation. But that's the Sex Discrimination Act. This is the Religious Discrimination Act. It only deals with discrimination on the grounds of religious belief or activity. And the second controversial, I don't, I don't even think that, that point should be controversial. Uh, the second point, which is controversial, is there is provision in the Act for um, moderate statements of belief to be protected from people being dragged before anti-discrimination tribunals for making what are called moderate statements of belief or unbelief. So if you make a statement of belief or unbelief, which is in good faith, not malicious, not threatening, not harassing, not vilifying someone, not counselling the commission of an offence, you jump all those hoops, then you can't be dragged to an anti-discrimination tribunal for making that statement. And that's dealing with Archbishop Porteous in Tasmania, I gave you that example before. It's a direct response to the misuse of anti-discrimination law by activists to try to stop people making moderate expressions of religious belief. So that's the point. That is, that is one point where there's some controversy, but I think properly understood in its limited way, 
uh, that is not that is not controversial either. We, we've had a number of examples, bizarre, scary, hypothetical examples put out there by LGBTI activists to say, oh, this law, the Federal Religious Discrimination Bill, would allow um, a nurse uh, to say to an HIV patient, you're evil and this is God's judgment on you. Um, well, first of all, I don't think any nurse would say that, so I don't think that's a real life example. But let's say someone did say that, and there's no, there's no. I should say these are all hypotheticals. No reported case of this actually ever happening, and it was the Sisters of Mercy uh, in the 1980s who treated AIDS patients when nobody else would. But okay, let's go with the hypothetical, unrealistic though it is. Um, is that a moderate statement of belief? Is it in good faith and not malicious? No. It's not going to pass the test of a moderate statement of belief. It's not going to get any protection. Secondly, the only protection that it would get would be to stop that nurse being taken to an anti-discrimination tribunal. There is no protection in this bill from complaints to the employer for breach of an employer code of conduct. So if someone did say that, I would imagine the employer would not be at all happy that a nurse was saying that to a patient in a hospital and the, the employer might well take disciplinary action against the nurse. There's nothing in the Religious Discrimination Bill to stop that. Complaint to an employer and employer taking action. So it's, it's a, A, it's a fanciful hypothetical, there are plenty of them. B, it won't get protection because it's not a moderate statement of belief. And C, even if it got protection, it's only against the person being taken to an anti-discrimination tribunal. It's not protection against complaints to the employer or employer sanctions. So that's, that's the five or 10% which is controversial. And I think properly looked at and carefully examined it's, it's a reasonable balance um, between the ability of people to make moderate expressions of their moderate statements of belief or unbelief and the rights of other people um, not to be vilified. Because you're not allowed, you can't vilify anyone under this act. Mark, there, there are those who say it doesn't go far enough. Mm. Where, where do you see shortcomings or potential shortcomings? Uh, yes. Uh, look, there's been a, uh, an interfaith group of leaders, um, uh, Christian, Protestant, Catholic, um, Reform, um, uh, a broad group, uh, Muslim, Sunni and Shia and Jewish and others who've been putting positions to the government. I think they would say it doesn't go far in two or three respects. One is they say that there should be some protection for employees when they make reasonable statements, moderate statements of faith outside of a work context, like in social media or at the pub. And that's a point that employers shouldn't be controlling the lives of their employees outside of the work context. Um, that's gone. That was there previously and that's gone. But I think, I think that could be reinstated, remembering that it's only moderate statements of belief. Second point is there is nothing in there to protect or, or to give people an, ob uh, sorry, to put an obligation on employers and others to make reasonable adjustments for, for religious belief. Uh, there's a provision in the uh, Disability Discrimination Act that says employers and workplaces and accommodation providers need to make reasonable adjustments for people with disability as long as it doesn't cause um, unreasonable hardship for the employer or the accommodation provider. So the sort of thing I'm thinking of there is uh, it's Friday uh, at the workplace. Um, we're coming up to midday prayers uh, time. Uh, someone goes off for a smoko, uh, leaves the factory floor, leaves people shorthanded. Someone else goes off to pray as a Muslim. Um, the, the employer pings them both because you weren't there at the workplace. Um, okay, people weren't there. Could some reasonable adjustment have been made? That is to say, were there enough people to sub on at that time to allow the Muslims to go and pray? Likewise, on a Saturday, um, could, could someone have subbed on to let the Jewish person or the Seventh-day Adventist have that day off as opposed to, you know, other people who didn't? So reasonable adjustments should be in there and... Uh, you know, it's not. The third point is that there is in this bill, and it's very welcome in my view, a limited override of the Victorian equal opportunity changes we, we had before, which would override the Victorian law to the extent of allowing religious schools to preference in employment decisions on the basis of an applicant or employee's religious belief or activity. So it would unwind the Victorian law, but only to the extent of religious schools preferencing. I think that should be expanded to cover an override for religious bodies as well. So, why, you know, if we if we agree with the principle that a, a a Christian school should be able to employ Christians and choose to employ Christians, why on earth wouldn't we say the same principle for a Christian church?
or if we agree it for a Muslim school, why wouldn't we say it for a mosque? So it should that override should be expanded beyond religious schools to cover religious bodies as well. They're probably three of the main things where this bill could be improved. A lot of the religious leaders' demands were left on the cutting floor in this process, um, and uh, that was done in the hope that the bill would be you know acceptable. But uh, <laughs> those who are opposed to it are still opposed to it. Sarah. Give us a historical perspective, you know, uh, wise people often say if you want to understand the future, look to the past. And the more you want to see into the future, the further you need to look in the past. Nothing's new under the sun. What you're really seeing here, it seems to me, is a rising tide of intolerance. Uh, and in particular, at the foundational Christian beliefs of Western society. They were the things we believed in, broadly speaking. Where's it? likely to trend in your future? Does it have a high watermark or will it simply get uh, more and more strident? Look, the trends, I agree, the trends are very concerning. Um, and as a historian, I think one of the things which is particularly apparent is the way that actually there are ideas to which we subscribe in some way as a society, to which we have held as incredibly important. So. I think key among these is the idea of the innate dignity and equality of human life. So the idea that all human beings are of equal worth and that my life is no more or less worthy than anybody else, regardless of gender or disability or ability and so forth, uh, race and so forth. One of the interesting things though, is that that idea together with a whole set of other related ideas that have become central to um, the development of theories of uh, justice in the West, theories of our understanding really of the purpose and the authority of government and the extent to which the government can legitimately exercise jurisdiction into private personal lives um, or issues of conscience and its free exercise and so forth, all the, all the kinds of things we were talking about here. All of these issues have historically this very rich tradition where there's a theological idea at their core and yet increasingly what we're seeing is that some kind of carapace of the idea seems to be maintained or in fact uh, kind of caricatured in some way. So there are still, if you look at kind of public debate today, particularly on social media, there's still ideas about uh, well, at least terms of justice and equality and so forth being bandied around. And yet the historical process seems that to be one of actually they've been secularized. And what I really mean by that is that they've actually had their theological underpinning taken out from underneath them. Now, in some ways, people would, it's fair to ask, okay, well, what's the problem with ideas being secularized? There's no problem with secularization as such of a particular idea, but it raises the particular question of, well, to what extent can you maintain a discussion or a lively kind of public debate where you uh, value the debate, value the ideas or can tolerate disagreement in the public sphere that we've been talking about, or indeed have laws which recognize the equal humanity of all people. To what extent can you maintain those ideas if you actually remove the, the idea which underpins them in the first place? So take the kind of particular example that I spoke about. If you no longer believe that every human being is of equal, or if you try to believe that uh, that all human lives are of equal value, but underneath it, you have no ability to ground that in anything, anything transcendent, um, particularly in the, the Christian, well, Judeo-Christian tradition in which that idea has come down to us in, um, in many countries and Western liberal democracies in particular, then the idea just falls apart. It just turns into a complete assertion. Um, and I think that's kind of, that is recognized on, on a level by many atheist philosophers like um, Peter Singer, for example, and there's a number of others, but um, I know Singer's work quite well. Peter Singer will quite happily say, yeah, of course, there's, that's a complete fiction to believe that every life is of equal worth. Um, but Singer in many, in many ways is sort of being courageous and entirely courageous in the sense that he is acting with integrity with his own beliefs there and quite openly admitting that he doesn't believe this because there's no foundation for it. Um, like Nietzsche. Yes, exactly. He's actually taking Nietzsche's idea about, well, 
the, the death of God, you have to actually admit that there is no God. So, well, what are we left with? The struggle for power. Basically. That's yeah. where Nietzsche ended up. And he yeah. went mad in a padded cell. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, just as a historian, what we, part of what we're seeing is that it's sort of caricature of certain ideas which we're clinging onto. We don't actually understand why. And if we lose the kind of under ability to kind of underpin those ideas with anything, then we are just left with a kind of series of completely ungrounded assertions in public debate. If this trend continues, do you think we'll get to the point where Christians who have always been encouraged to obey the law, support the government of the day, pray for it, submit themselves, look for order, will openly disobey? Look, we'll have to, uh, uh, you know, question their conscience as to whether there are areas where they engage in civil disobedience. Yeah, the question of civil Christian civil disobedience is an interesting one. Um, I think it's important to recognise there is a, a long and complex historical tradition of thinking about the circumstances under which a, a law is just or unjust and the type of disobedience that's required. It's a tradition that goes back to... Um, writers in the early church who are in turn drawing upon Greek and Roman philosophy and also, more importantly, biblical sources, and then gets developed. But I think actually your question raises a really interesting point um, about the future. And there's actually a kind of prior question to the question of civil disobedience. And that is that I think faith communities, uh, regardless whether they're Christian, uh, personally, I'm, I happen to be a Christian, but regardless of their type uh, or their form, there's a, I think there's a need for faith communities to strengthen themselves and to really kind of turn, in many ways, turn to the kind of historical riches of their tradition, the intellectual riches as well, the liturgical riches. Um, and there are calls for this, like you, um, you know, we talked earlier before about people like Rodrea um, and others talking about the importance of actually like faith communities building a serious kind of committed countercultural community which actually resists the kind of radical individualism in society. And I think by strengthening those communities, by turning to the historical riches of different faith communities, it will strengthen faith communities to be in a position, a far stronger position, um, to be able to live and to contribute to a flourishing liberal democracy where we tolerate each other and can disagree with each other um, lovingly, um, in the public sphere. Mm. I agree with that. Formation of religious believers, formation of young Christians in those sort of traditions, fundamentally important. And the, um, the creation and preservation of spaces, uh, you know, churches, religious bodies, religious schools and educational institutions, tertiary as well, where that can happen is, is I think, the way going forward. Because we, we, we will live in a sea of pluralism, but we need to be... Um, well, religious people need to be strong in their in their values, in their history, in in what they believe and how they live and how they express that. And they'll need to reinforce that with each other very, very intentionally in a way that perhaps we've we've lost in the last few years by basically relying on the public school system or or, or the media. We'll need to be far more intentional about formation and reminding ourselves of who we are and where we've come from and then how we live. Well, thank you very much. There's a good note to end on because I think it strikes me that the charge I would make against this endless progressivism is that it's resulted in a very unhappy society. The levels of anxiety, of depression, of self-harm, especially amongst young people, suggests that people will one day want answers again. They will go looking for the way to think through, is there any meaning, is there any purpose, is there any point? And one of the reasons we need to keep the public square as open as possible for these discussions is that people will again hunger, I think, to explore these issues. And we need to make certain it's possible to do so. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much so much to both of you for your time. Thank, My pleasure. Thank you for inviting us, John. Thanks. Thank you for watching this episode. If you value vital conversations like this one, please like, share, subscribe, and join the conversation.